All right, good morning. Welcome to Cross Community Church. Really glad to be here this morning. Um, I'm introducing our speaker, Matt Whitson. Uh, Jason and his family are on vacation this morning and really glad for them to have a break and to, to be able to relax. Uh, Matt Whitson and his wife, Becca, work with the Arkansas Family Alliance. Uh, they work with the poor, the needy, the underprivileged, the fatherless, the motherless, all those kind of people, um, counseling and, and partnering with them and building them up. And really glad to have him here this morning. Uh, they attend church at the Community Bible North Campus. And that's how we have known Matt over the years is through Community Bible. Um, he's been preaching. We've had him at events, baccalaureates, uh, camp speakers for students, and just really glad that he is here this morning. Would you guys join me in welcoming Matt Whitson? Good morning. Let me try that again, Brandon. Will you give your speech again, and then we'll start over? Just no, I'm just joking. Good morning. So Brandon and I, we don't go as far back as Jason and I, but. Um, Here's how far back Brandon and I go. I was, my office is over by Jeff's Clubhouse in Fort Smith, where my wife and I have our nonprofit and our counseling business. And I was, uh, anytime I take a long phone call or need to have a call, I get my steps in. You know what I'm saying? You know what your steps are, right? So I just start walking around these, this building. Well, I see Brandon out in the parking lot of Jeff's. He's done what any good pastor has done at lunchtime. He's uh, eaten. And uh, so I see him. And I, he's getting in his car, and I walk up to his window, and I knock on his window, and he turns and looks at me, and I said, you have $5? And Brandon rolls his window down and looks at me and goes, no, I don't have any cash. And I was like, bro, you don't even know who you're talking to, do you? He, anyway, it is, uh, Brandon didn't realize who it was, but we are, uh, again, thankful to be here. Can I ask you guys to do something really quick before we move into uh, the sermon and break and open God's word? Can you just bow your heads and close your eyes just a second with me? I'm not going to give an invitation early so you can get out of here early. Every good pastor has a lot to say, but I, I want to just take a minute and I want you to pray for your lead pastor. So if you know Jason, we go back and he and his family are, are just trying to get some rest. Just take a minute and ask God in the stillness of this place just to Encourage him while he's away. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So thank you for doing that. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 is where we'll turn in just a second. We're going to read a few verses. Before I start, I'll, I'll start this way. I need to know your age by show of hands. How many of you know what a transistor radio is? Raise your hand. Okay. There's not a kid in the room, really, I guess, that doesn't. If you're, oh, I got, you're not a kid, but you're younger than most of these. So if you know what a transistor radio is, it is, it's the one my father had that I was accustomed to at my house when I was a child growing up that he listened to all the time. It was just a little square looking box. It was a radio. It's not something you go on Siri and say, hey, Siri, play transistor radio. It's, 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 it has, it is, not that complicated, right? But in order to make a transistor, right, radio work, it had to transmit uh, air radio waves from the tower to the radio so that you get the voices and the songs and the things you need. Everybody understand that, right? It had a long antenna on it you would pull out. And if you're at my house where we lived when I was growing up, it still struggled with the airwaves. So you would go get some aluminum foil and attach it to the end just to make it, you know, grab some more waves, if you will. But my dad, all the time, every single day, especially on Sunday afternoons, he would have this transistor radio stuck to his ear. He'd be listening to it before he Put, uh, put, listen to this radio. It, it, all transistor radios would have a little dial on it. If you turn it one way, the, the little knob or the little orange hand on the, on the, on the, on the uh, transistor radio would go back and forth. It had numbers on it. You could go to AM or you go to FM. If you're really fancy, you had a, one with FM on it. Most of them just had AM on it. Well, my dad was looking for AM 1230. And the reason that he was looking for it was because he wanted to listen to the St. Louis Cardinals. Anybody Cardinal fans? Okay. Yeah, back here in the back. Good. The littlest kid's raising his hand. He didn't know who the Cardinals are. 
It's great. But he would, he would take that transistor radio, he would pull the antenna out, and he would move the dial looking for 1230, and he would get it around there, and you could hear the, the, the transmission, shh, 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 you know what I'm talking about, and finally he would get to the spot where the, the game came in clear enough to where he could hear it. There was Jack Buck, Mike Shannon, two old-time commentators, play-by-play -play guys. And on that radio, as it came through the airwaves, you would hear Jack Buck and Mike Shannon describing the action, the smells, the sounds, the players and what were going on. And you could hear the crowd in the background, and you would almost have to just imagine yourself, picture yourself being there. They would describe it so good that you felt like that you were actually sitting in a seat in St. Louis, Missouri at the old Bush Stadium. One, one summer, my parents had saved up enough money, and they're, thought, they're thinking about, or they were planning a vacation so that we could finally get somewhere and, and specifically go to uh, St. Louis Cardinal baseball games and go to St. Louis and, 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 and go finally take into sight the, the, the sounds and the sights and, and the smells of Bush Stadium and St. Louis and downtown St. Louis. And so we loaded up in this old car. We had an old Plymouth car that we had, right? And you don't even know what Plymouths are anymore, do you? And so you jump in this car. You really didn't have any seat belts. You could just you get uh, start driving. It was slow and it was hot and we didn't have any air condition. And so our air, air condition was 460. You know what a 460 AC is? Hello? Are y'all awake? This is 11 o'clock service. Four windows down, 60 miles an hour, right? And we're kids in the back seat. There's three of us. You, and back in those days, they didn't have any really laws about seat belts, and you just jumped over and hung out the window and did whatever you wanted to do. And finally, we get close enough to St. Louis that the first thing you begin to see is this massive arch that set in the, in the, in the uh, background, the backdrop of Bush Stadium, and you could see it. And as you gro uh, uh, drove closer, the arch began to get bigger and bigger until you get into downtown St. Louis, and you begin to see some of these things that have been described to you on this radio and you go check in the downtown hotel and then you park your car and you begin to walk to the stadium to go to your first St. Louis Cardinal baseball game. And we walk downtown and we get out in front and there's people everywhere and there's people holding up ticket signs or tickets trying to buy tickets and they're talking and you start to smell a smell of hot dogs that were described and, and all these other smells that you and you hand this man your ticket and you walk in the concourse and you begin to go up um, this windy little la uh, um, I guess it's just an incline that gets to the row we're in the top deck right we're in, not the, the unexpensive seats and we get up there to the top and you walk through the foyer of, of, of this, of this uh, area that you're in and you walk out and finally you see the players you see the fans you see everything as a little child that was told to you described to you on this transistor radio. I was in awe. In fact, I could not believe what I was seeing. Today, I'm going to ask you to imagine with me, pretend like, if you will, with me, like when we were children, so that we can understand the magnitude of of Mark 2 verses 1 through 12. Will you imagine it with me? Yes? I hope so. Let's read it together. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Bear with me. We're going to read this uh, text. We'll say a little prayer over it. Then we'll jump right into it. And it says this, And when he, that's talking about Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered, excuse me, together so that there was no more room, not even at, at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and they had a, a, made an opening, and they lay the, let him down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. He rose and immediately picked up his bed and he went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we've never seen We've never saw anything like this. Let's pray. Father, today, for my friends here at Cross Community, I pray that you would begin to steal their minds of the things that they have done and have to do, that you would open their ears to the words that are powerful, and I pray that you soften their hearts So don't those words take deep root. That as we listen to what it is that you would have us here today, I pray that we examine our hearts, our lives, see what adjustments we need to make in order to live based on what your scriptures say. In this moment, I pray, Father, that the words that come out of my mouth are spirit-led and spirit-driven not so that I can boast, but instead, Father, so that we make much of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Jesus, he is back home in Capernaum. He is making his home in Capernaum. Now let's set this stage here, uh, understand the context of uh, of the setting and the time and, and, and the time of Jesus' ministry. See, John the Baptist had paved the way. He had begun to make much of Jesus and, and began to get a, gr- a big group of disciples or following because they were telling about, he was telling about Jesus. He was, at this point, he now was decreasing so that Jesus was increasing and those that were following John the Baptist had now begun to follow Jesus. And Jesus had begun to call disciples. He was healing. He was showing himself. He was uh, uh, He was here on this earth doing what he was uh, supposed to be doing. And so here he is at a home in Capernaum. And and the way I would describe Jesus' ministry at this point of his life is it was rolling. And he's in this house. He's in this home. In the town he was making his home in. And the scriptures say that he was preaching. He was talking about the word. People were amazed by his, what he was saying. So much so that this massive group of people, this massive following of people were in this home and there was basically a, a standing room only. And four friends had heard about, I'm assuming, what Jesus had done away from Capernaum. And as he was doing his ministry, the word began to travel about healing. And the word began to travel about what he was doing and what he was saying. So they decided to take their friend who was paralyzed, could not walk, to the man that had they had heard about. And so they put him on a mat and they begin to take him where Jesus is and they get there and because it's standing room only, it was, it was coming out of the front door, the scripture says, that they begin to try to figure out a way to get their friend, their paralyzed friend that is on a mat that is helpless to Jesus. And so they climb up, climb up this man-made ladder to the top of this roof. The roof would have been made of sticks and clay and hay and different kinds of things that would been, uh, uh, they would be able to build a house with. And a lot of times they would have had a, an animal or two on top of it, a small animal or two, just to keep them caged in. They get to the top of this house, and in order to get their friend to Jesus, they begin to dig. 
They begin to dig out a hole, an opening, Scripture says, and, 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 and so that they can now lay their, this, this friend, begin to take their friend down to Jesus. And here comes this friend, and he comes to the spot at Jesus' feet. I wonder what the paralyzed man must have felt like. Imagine the scene. A debris field. Jesus is speaking. People are gathered. A debris field begins to fall on fully God and fully man himself who is preaching the word to those that are gathered. And I don't know about you, but if all of a sudden debris began to fall in this place today, you would first look up to say, what in the world is happening? And second, you would probably begin to run out these doors thinking that the place was going to cave in. I imagine the scene was the same. And the debris field began to fall. The people began to look up. And all of a sudden, if that was not something uh, crazy as it was, here comes a man coming down on a mat, being lowered by his four friends through this roof, through the ceiling, and begins to uh, 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 get down into the face of Jesus. I wonder what the man must have felt like on the mat that was hopeless but helpful, skeptical but excited, had heard about Jesus. He was approaching Jesus in faith. His friends believed that Jesus could do something about it. And here comes this man being lowered down. Jesus pauses his talk, and he turns, and he looks at this man that is lowered down. And Jesus and the man begin to... To the paralytic man make eye contact. I wonder what the paralyzed man on the mat that was helpless and hopeless at that point he's now seen Jesus the one he had heard about the one that he was there to see and they make eye contact and Jesus follows him down and the man, the paralytic man, is placed at Jesus' feet. And I imagine the man looks up and thinking that any minute I'm going to be healed. That's what he's there for. Watch what happens. Watch the turn of events. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, their approach, when Jesus saw their confidence and their trust in who Jesus is, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Imagine in that spot, at that time, when the man is laying there helpless. He cannot move, expecting to be healed of his paralysis. And Jesus looks down at him and says to him, Son, your sins are forgiven. At that moment, Jesus, understanding the greater picture, understanding the greater need, understanding the primary need, Jesus addresses his primary need first. And he says to him, your sins are forgiven. Do you remember when Jesus addressed your primary need first? I think that we forget about it, and a lot of time our approach is, Jesus, what can you do for me today? With expectations of a blessing or something to happen. But at the root of it, we are all sinners in need of Jesus to say to us, Son, your sins are forgiven. He addresses the first need, the primary need, the most important need of the paralytic man first. And he wants to do that with you also. I remember in vacation Bible school and Sunday school, my mom was a Sunday school teacher. My dad was a, a deacon and when we're reading scripture, I remember them always asking me, and this is what I'm asking you to do today. I want you to go with me and just imagine the scene a little bit more, right? Let's examine the other characters so that we kind of understand a little bit more about 
uh, uh, this, this story. And so the first thing I wanted to address this morning from the character angle are the four friends, right? The four friends, the ones that dropped the man down and tore, tore a hole into, in this roof so that they get the, this man at the feet of Jesus. And I've heard the friends describe in commentaries something like this, that they were, watch this, and ask yourself, am I this kind of friend? Uh, they are confident they're confident in Jesus and what he can do. They're compassionate for their friend and they're creative in their ways. They were completely committed to make sure that they could get this friend, the paralyzed, the man that they brought to Jesus, they were completely committed to get them to Jesus. Here's what those people are to this man. Here's what they are to him. They are his Sunday school class. They are his small group. They are the ones that are closest to him. They are the surrounding people that when, when things in your life are not very good or struggling or we have a death or we have a baby or we need something. These friends are this man's small group. Who are your small group? If you can't answer that, my suggestion would be to get with one of these staff members at this church and say, you know what? I need that kind of people in my life. I don't have that. And I know I need that. We are made for community. No matter the circumstances in our life, we are still made to address that together, not alone. This man, though he be isolated because of his paralysis, was not isolated because he had a small group. Second, the scribes. The scribes, and look, look at what it says. It says that, in verse 6, it says, Now some of the scribes, remember the story, the man had just been forgiven uh, on the mat there, and the, the scribes, after Jesus forgives him of his, sins, it says, uh, of his sins, he says, Now some of the scribes were sitting there, this is verse 6, sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And one, I just want you to picture this with me. So Jesus is talking. The man comes down from the mat. Everybody, Everybody's quiet now, just saying, like, what in the world's fixing to happen? Jesus forgives him of his sins. Over in the corner over here, uh, that the, the, the mumbling scribes are, are over there, the ones that are like, who in the world is this Jesus? Let's go check him out. They're the teachers of the law. They're the important ones. They're the ones that knew all of the uh, of the Bible answers. They're the ones that, that were supposed to be, uh, people were supposed to be following them and, and focusing on them because they're the ones that knew everything. They were the religious ones. So they're over here in this corner, the corner of this house, and Jesus forgives them of their sins. And the word that is described is a word that we find around Jesus a lot in Scripture, especially in Mark, as he's a lot of times telling what Peter said. And the word is this. Look at it. Verse 8, it says, Immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or rise, take a walk. Well, watch this. Just picture the scribes that are sitting right over here, okay? Picture Jesus standing here, crowd full of people, scribes. The man's laying at Jesus' feet. And he says to the man, your sins are forgiven. And these men over here, these scribes over here, in their hearts, they don't say it out loud. In their hearts, they begin to question Jesus. And the word immediately is used. Imagine the scene. Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. And he turns and looks at the scribes. What would you do? I would be like, uh, I don't know why he's looking at me. What, Jesus, what? What? At that moment, immediately Jesus knew in their hearts what they were thinking, and he knows what you're thinking too. Because he's the divine God that knows our thoughts, knows your hearts. And in Scripture, when we read the Bible, when we read Scripture, Probably the most, I guess it would be the most important thing that my mom and my dad and these Sunday school teachers of old and these Bible school teachers of old would have taught me was this. When you read Scripture, when you read script, Scripture, ask yourself this question. What does this text, what does this Scripture say about God? 
And so when we read this scripture this morning and we ask ourselves the most important thing, what does it say about God? Let's just think about it together before we move on. That Jesus healed this man. He, he, he forgave him of his sins. And at the end of the story, we'll get to it in a second. It says that he, is, he, he, that he for, uh, uh, that healed him and he forgave him. So it is just telling us that his words have power. Not only that, in the story of the scribes, the section of the scribes, he knew exactly what he was thinking. Jesus is divine. He knows our thoughts. He knew their thoughts. And Jesus then, he proves his authority and his divinity. And he tells the man, get up from your mat. Get up from your mat and walk. We don't know why the man was on the mat. We don't know if it's something that he did that caused him to be there. He was born this way. We don't know. What we do know is the curse of sin is, is heavy on all of us. And the reason that, that pain and suffering and evil and, and frustration and all of the things that you can describe happens is because of the misencounter with a tree in the middle of the garden that Adam and Eve have. And when sin enters the world, it brings a curse that, that completely changes our relationship with God and how God intended it. And so what we do know is this man, because of the curse of sin, is hurting. Whether it was his own sin or the nature of sin. And we don't know how long he's been there or why. But what I do know is that life comes at us really fast, doesn't it? Hello? Doesn't it? Or is it just me? Surely it's not just me. It comes at you really fast. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Let me rewind. I'm a dad of three teenagers and a six-year-old. It feels like every single day at the end of the day that someone has stood in front of me and punched me in the face over and over and over, right? Right? No one told me how hard it was going to be to have teenagers. These babies, I loved them. I was thinking, no, it's got to get easier. No, it doesn't get easier. Y'all are crazy in a good way. But life comes at you fast. I have these massive expectations on me. You do too. To be and do. And I feel like that a lot of times that if I take my shirt off, I'm supposed to have this S on my chest, I'm supposed to be have these superpowers that I'm supposed to, and then you add COVID to the mix, and you add shutting down church and community and businesses and, and losing, losing jobs, and you have all of this stuff, and it feels real, real, real heavy. Life comes at you fast. So I, anybody pour concrete? Everybody, ever, yep. You know when you pour concrete, if you've never poured concrete, you just don't, the concrete does basically whatever it wants to do, right? And you're just hoping to get it in the right spot. You don't want to ever try to put it just, as it flows. You just kind of let it guide and make sure it, 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 does, it goes where it's supposed to. And if you've ever put your feet in it, no matter how deep it is, I mean, it is hard to walk and hard to pull yourself out of. That's how my life was about two months ago. Like I felt like that I was on a daily basis trying to move concrete and walk in concrete. Maybe you call it quicksand. Maybe you call it mud. But we've all been in situations in our life that we felt that way. If, you have, if you're saying, I've never been in a situation like that in your life, then I would say to you, you're lying to me. I felt that way a few months ago. And my best friend, who is my wife, said to me, let's talk. So out to the front porch we went and we began to talk. And she says, what's going on? You seem a little off. Well, as men, we don't want to get vulnerable, do we? As men, we're like, no, I, I want to start being defensive and saying, I'm fine. I, I'm, I don't want you to think that I'm weak. I'm your security. I'm, I'm, I'm the father of this house. I'm, I'm your husband. I'm, I've got an S on my chest. I can make it through this. But I didn't do it. And I told her how I was feeling. I said, I'm, I'm struggling. I just, I don't know why. Just everything came at me at once. And I'm just like, I don't feel like I'm in a very good spot. 
And here's what she said, and here's what we need to allow other people to do, and here's how, what kind of friend we need to be. She said this, here's what we're going to do. So we planned a, a vacation. She did. She said, you probably need to start getting back to your counselor because counselors to me are very important, especially when you work with the amount of, amount of traumatic uh, children that we work with and, and there's trauma in your own home, right? And so I don't care if it's about getting with a counselor. I don't care if it's about taking a vacation or taking some time or, 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 or whatever it looks like. What we need to do, and most importantly, because how sin harms us and sin harms the world and life comes at us very fast, is we need to get back to the feet of Jesus. And the other character in this story, the man that comes from the ceiling that are being lowered down from the, uh, from the roof by his four friends, I feel like that if you ask yourself today, where am I in this story? We all can say to ourselves, we are the man on the mat. First of all, paralyzed by our sin. And second of all, paralyzed by something in our life. We are all paralyzed by something. Paralyzed by fear. Let me see if I can address one for you. Paralyzed by past relationships and present relationships. Paralyzed by abuse. Paralyzed by addiction, depression, anxiety, a job, our past. We may not be paralyzed physically. Some of us are. But we're all paralyzed emotionally, mentally, and we're all paralyzed by our sin. This man comes through the roof. He's helpless but hopeful and skeptical but excited. But what he is, watch. He's vulnerable. Oh, we don't like that word, do we? Oh, I'm out. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will enter, uh, enter into the kingdom of God. Blessed are the spiritual bankrupt, because they understand their need for Jesus. They understand that they cannot do it on their own. They understand the dynamic of the relationship between God and man, based on the sin that separates us, that they need Jesus. I cannot do this on my own. We need Jesus. We all are on the mat, needing to be placed at the feet of Jesus, admitting our sins, addressing our conflicts and our hurts and our pains and our fears, realizing that vulnerability is the first step in reconciling our relationship with God. I need you, God. I need you in my life. So Jesus, after going to his deepest needs, his deepest need first, then says to the man, I want you to get up and I want you to walk away. He addresses his secondary need. Jesus heals his body, tells him, get up, take your mat, and go home. He didn't say, get up, do some stretches, get up, have some physical therapy, he didn't say, get up and I want you to go slow and let me get some guys to help you walk out of here. Jesus says, get up. And the word that comes up again in verse 12 is it says that he immediately picked up his uh, bed and he went out before them all. What I love about Jesus is this. What I love about Jesus, not only in this story, but in our life is this, is that Jesus has the last word. In this story, he has the last word. And in our lives, he will have the last word. There will be no more fear, no more relationship problems, no more abuse, no more addiction, no more depression, no more anxiety, no more cancer, no more sickness, and no more death. Because, watch, the Son of Man has conquered death. Aren't you glad? Hello. Hello. 
You should be applauding and excited and happy because the Son of Man on your behalf so that there won't be any more of this mess in our life. We say to God, I need you in my life. I'm vulnerable. Please forgive me of my sins. Here's some pain that's going on in my life. And Jesus doesn't push us aside and say to us, no, you're, you're, you're too bad. You're too rough. This is too hard. No, he says, lay right here at my feet. And let me address your primary need first. And then let me walk with you. The Son of Man has conquered death. Thanks be to God. And then to conclude, here's what it says in verse 12. After the man got up from the mat, he says this, or the scripture says this, so that they, that's the people that are around this room, the packed house, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. When is the last time that you said that about Jesus? When's the last time that you have said, oh my goodness, I'm amazed by you and what you've done. I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, how in the world can you ever do that? Because you're fully God and fully man. You have the power and authority. Your words have power. You are divine and you are the son of man. And I'm going to show you that power as we read in scripture that he's going to heal you, that he's going to walk with you, that he's going to comfort you, that he's going to give you friends, that he's going to do whatever it takes in order to address your primary and your secondary needs. When's the last time that we've said, man, I'm amazed by God. Because if it's been a while, watch this, we probably need then to get back to the feet of Jesus. The feet of Jesus. Some of us need to be the friend and take our, soul, our friends to the feet of Jesus, and others just need to lay there and soak up his presence and say, I need you. We all have a response based on today's text. What is your response? Will you bow your heads with me? A few questions for you this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as we sing this last song and Brandon comes up here and he'll be here to, to talk to you. Has Jesus ever forgiven you of your sins? Today I would ask that you approach him with great confidence, understanding that he can address your primary need first, and that is your sins. He can forgive you. He died for your sin and he died for your shame. And because of the power of God, three days later God rose him from the grave. The gospel of Jesus can change your soul. He's the same God that has walked with you through your toughest times, through your fear and abuse and relationship problems or whatever it looks like. He's walked with you. When does the last time that you rec remembered that and recognized that and said to him, thank you, Lord? When's the last time you told someone your story so that they could also be amazed at what God has done for you. And he's also put people in your life to support you and encourage you. Are you one of those people? Who's your small group? Have you thanked them and have you hugged them and told them how grateful you are for what Jesus has done for you? We're all on the mat. Jesus responds. He does his part ask you this question this morning. What is your response to who God is and what he's done for us? Brandon's going to be standing up here. If you need to pray to ask God to forgive you of your sins, please walk up here and tell him that so he can start you on the road to being a follower of Jesus. Maybe you need to come down here at the front and, and just ask, just, just remember God and what he's done for you. Maybe you need to pray for your friends and go to one of those friends and uh, just begin to together address a crisis that's in your life. The gospel, scriptures, 
They demand a response. What is your response today? So in the next minute or two, Father, as we pause and sing this last song and respond to you and you alone, I ask you, God, through the power of your spirit to move in here, give people great courage and confidence and compassion to address what it is that you would ask them to address. In Jesus' name I pray.